The Night Beat starts right now. Is there an end in sight? A local school district could finally find out who will fill its vacant board seat, but not without some controversy. Growing up with a hearing impairment is challenging for kids, and that's why a local nonprofit is making playtime more enjoyable for all kids. Plus. So these people are no oh, here. yeah, they were disgusting. A low health inspection score, the least of the problems facing a West Side restaurant. What Tim Gerber learned when he stopped by the location this week. But first tonight, we start with this. Cleanup is underway tonight after a small tornado touched down in San Antonio. That was early this morning. Yeah, there are videos out there sent to us through KSAT Connect showing that storm and a funnel cloud. It left damage at a school and apartment complex off Austin Highway in the Alamo Heights area. Yeah, people are getting out there fixing what was damaged. That's video from just a little while ago when roofers worked on an apartment complex in the Alamo Heights area. So Adam, tell us, how are things looking right now? Right now, we don't have anything on the radar screen. It's going to be a quiet night. Actually, low clouds are filling in and we'll have some fog, I think, to affect us later tonight and early tomorrow. Last few little sprinkles have pushed closer to the Gulf Coastline. Locally, when you look at the uh, authority rainfall, Doppler radar estimates, whenever you see yellow on the screen, that indicates a minimum of two inches estimated by Doppler radar. And the real bullseye was parts of Wilson County in southeastern Bear County, where several of the stronger storms actually followed each other. They were training. So we had between three to six inches of rain, not just estimated by the radar, but also proven by area rain gauges. Lavernia, Sutherland Springs to Stockdale. Though you go to the west and southwest side of San Antonio and significantly lesser amounts, but luckily drought stricken Comal County really had a good day today between one and three inches, even in and around Canyon Lake, three inches estimated by Doppler radar. Tomorrow we start the day with some fog, a, a few sprinkles here and there, a 20% chance, but into the afternoon, those rain chances, they rise. They'll become scattered in nature. So widely separated downpours popping up again, coming and going pretty quick, splash and dash with a little bit of lightning and thunder through the afternoon and early evening tomorrow. 40% coverage basically at any given point tomorrow afternoon uh, throughout our area. We're likely to have 40% uh, of our area covered with some of those pop up showers and storms. We'll talk more about our next good opportunity for rain, which involves the strong cold front and how cold it's going to get when it arrives coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Now to the fallout in Lewiston, Maine, after the deadliest mass shooting in the U.S. since the Uvalde school massacre. The suspect in the killing of at least 18 people still at large tonight. Those who live in Lewiston being asked to stay in their homes. 40 year old Robert Card, the gunman suspected of killing those 18 people and injuring more at a bowling alley and then at a bar. Tonight we're hearing from some of the people who lost loved ones and experienced the chaos firsthand. We just kept running and there was shots fired outside the building after and we just kept running and running and running. When you get anything that happens like this, you go, you go empty. Tonight, police and FBI agents were outside the home of the suspect's last known address. While it's not known if the suspect was inside the home at one time, authorities could reportedly be heard on a loudspeaker saying, come out with your hands up. Those law enforcement officers have left for the night. No arrests made. And back here at home soon, one of the largest school districts in the area could finally get a new school board member. We know that trustees from Northeast ISD could vote on an interim member tomorrow morning. As the night team's John Paul Barajas reports, this particular seat has been open nearly three months now. That's right. Trustee Terry Williams passed away in August after a long illness. Since then, there has been some back and forth on the board over her successor. Trustees interviewed four candidates Monday night. Case that investigates has learned one of those candidates was sued by NEISD last year. Jacqueline Klein was also sued by Bear County and the city of San Antonio, all for allegedly not paying her property taxes. Lawsuit records show Klein owed just over $8,400 in taxes, penalties, and interest when the lawsuit was filed in January of 2022. Court records show Klein was unsuccessfully served in the case in May. Case that investigates confirmed that lawsuit is still pending. As of tonight, Klein has not returned Case calls for comment. 
Klein previously ran for the single member District 2 seat last year. She lost to Terry Williams by less than 80 votes. Sources tell KSAT Klein has the support of three of the board's six trustees, but she has faced questions from other trustees over past social media posts and her backing from a conservative political action committee. Again, Klein was one of four candidates interviewed Monday night. Trustees met in a two hour long executive session after those interviews before announcing tomorrow's vote. That is set for 8.30 a.m. The person appointed will serve until the May election unless they run and are elected. Now, Paul Barajas, Kisa, 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. An immigration bill now headed to Governor Greg Abbott's desk. The Texas House passed Senate Bill 4 early this morning. According to the Texas Tribune, that legislation would increase the penalty for smuggling immigrants or operating a stash house. If the governor signs the bills, those signs those that bill, those convicted would face a minimum sentence of 10 years. Right now it is two. Border security part of this special session's agenda along with COVID mandates and school vouchers. Lawmakers passed a bill yesterday that bans COVID-19 mandates by private employers, but that is yet to be signed by the governor. Both the Texas House and Senate still working on school voucher legislation. And tonight we're also learning more about the San Antonio police officer who shot and killed a man earlier this week. San Antonio police say that officer John Carroll shot and killed 34 year old Ruben Garcia after the two struggled over Garcia's handgun. Now the officer was wearing a body camera at the time, but that footage, that particular footage that hasn't been released right now. Carroll is on administrative leave, which is protocol, and he's been with San Antonio police for four years. When thank you isn't enough. An emotional moment for good Samaritans and a police officer who was shot in the line of duty while responding to a domestic dispute call on the city's northeast side. Officer Francisco Viscara was one of two officers who were shot during that call. Josh O'Reil and his wife were nearby and they came to his aid. Jesus was looking out for us. I think so, yes. And uh, I really appreciate everything you did because being in there in your house gave me some safety. Um, yes. You stopped the bleeding, which was huge. They took the officer into their own home. They gave, put a tourniquet on his injury. The couple that helped that injured officer presented with several gifts in recognition of their selfless actions. You can see the full story right now on KSAT.com. And now to a night beat update. It's been two years and family members of two people who were killed while watching a drag race in Kerrville are still looking for justice. They've already filed lawsuits against race promoters, a car dealership and the driver of the Mustang that lost control before hitting a crowd. A family attorney believes that leaders in Kirk County are also responsible. This past week, they filed a lawsuit against the city of Kerrville, the Kerrville Kerr County Joint Airport Board and airport manager Mary Rohrer. They were ultimately uh, in charge of inspecting the grounds, making sure that everything that they wanted done was done the way that it was supposed to be done, the way that they agreed upon. So the attorney also says the families are hoping that this lawsuit sends a message. Eight-year-old Santiago Martinez and his aunt, Rebecca Cedillo, were killed while they were watching that drag race. Earlier this week on the Night Beat, we showed you how Santiago's mother has been honoring her son's legacy with a toy drive for other children. You can read about it right now on KSAT.com. Just look for this article. A low score on a recent health inspection, the least of the problems a West Side Mongolian grill was facing. Now the landlord tells the night team's Tim Gerber the business was evicted for being behind on rent and also left behind a huge mess behind the kitchen door. Genghis Grill, formerly located in the 8600 block of State Highway 151, got a 77 on a late August health inspection that included six repeat violations. Multiple dead roaches were found in numerous traps around the business. The buffet cold hold was too warm. The dishwashing machine had zero sanitizer. The bar area didn't have any hot water and was shut down by the inspector. When I stopped by this week, I learned the restaurant was no longer in operation. This letter posted on the front door stated they were evicted for not paying rent. The landlord was in the process of clearing the place out. Oh, yeah, they were disgusting. Really? What happened? They're dirty. They didn't pay rent. The landlord said there were still roaches inside and she hoped to have a new tenant once everything is cleaned up. 
Gibby's La Cucina, located in the 2600 block of Nogalito Street, got a failing score of 69 on their August 30th inspection. Hair was found in the sugar. It was removed. Clean utensils were being stored in dirty containers. A worker touched the floor, then touched food prep areas. The inspector stepped in and asked them to wash their hands. They were storing bread into go-style bags. The mop sink was clogged and unusable, while another sink didn't have cold water. A roach was seen along a wall, and there was a buildup of grease on a vent hood. A reinspection was required. The business was not open when I stopped by this week, and a posting online showed they were temporarily closed. Jim's Coffee Shop, located in the 8400 block of Broadway, earned an 85 on their late August inspection. The score was a departure from previous scores in the high 90s. According to this report, it appears they were dealing with a roach problem at the time. An uncovered mix used to batter chicken was contaminated by a roach. The inspector wrote there was a significant amount of cockroaches at different life stages throughout the establishment. The report shows the business was actively receiving pest control services. The floors were also dirty with grease and food debris. We're behind the kitchen door. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Now we want you to stick around. Helping the hearing impaired. That is the mission for one local nonprofit. How it's making playtime more fun for kids with hearing impairments. And we're counting down the days to this year's Dia de los Muertos Festival. It's happening this weekend, October 28th and 29th at Hemisphere. To get your tickets and learn more about it, scan the QR code on your screen. Hope to see you there. With hundreds of playgrounds across the city, one nonprofit wants to make at least one of them more accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing community. The night team's Avery Everett shows what this means for deaf accessibility across San Antonio. It's a long time coming, yeah. So it's just very special. This playground was built with a purpose. We designed it where it has limited static electricity. And to the team of San Antonio nonprofit, Ate the Silent, it's all about accessibility for the deaf and hard of hearing community. You know, when I was growing up, I always felt lonely on the playground. That's where I felt like I couldn't really belong or understand. I played by myself a lot. This playground is strategically designed with deaf accessibility in mind. Like this slide, it's completely metal. That's because sometimes there's static going down a plastic slide that can wipe out the programming in a cochlear implant. It is just amazing to me how much I've learned for the, from this project. Eat the Silent is one of 100 community nominated projects across the United States. It's selected to be a part of the 2023 Lowe's Hometowns Community Impact Project. In just a couple of months, they've renovated sidewalks, created an outdoor area, and built this playground. It made me feel like the kids have freedom to be here and have more space to have fun. Once a nine-year-old student, now turned a 19-year-old volunteer. Aid the Silence, Kendall Warish says this playground gives young kids who are deaf or hard of hearing a place to just be called kids. So they feel like I can't play, so this one is the best, but now they can play and they're deaf. From the stage to the slides. They feel good up for now. Aid the Silent is building a community and now a playground too. With that grant, Aid the Silent was also able to redo their walkways. They were able to make their sidewalks more wheelchair accessible. Take a look. They were able to connect the street to the sidewalks. Another effort to increase accessibility here in San Antonio. Now, the grand opening for all of this is on November 15th. But if you want to help, you can head on over to KSAT.com. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. I absolutely love that story. Unfortunately, that's not something you think about unless you have somebody in your family or you yourself are hearing impaired. But yeah, children should be able to enjoy going to the playground without worrying about that. All children yes. should be allowed to do that. All right, love that. 76 degrees out there. Got some rain. We expecting some more tomorrow, Adam? Yeah, we are. Throughout the day tomorrow, the rain chances are going to rise, particularly in the afternoon. Not so much in the morning, just some fog to deal with. But later on in the day, Widely separated downpours popping up and then another round of beneficial rain Sunday night from the strong cold front, the long awaited cold front, which 
arrives around sunset on Sunday. That's going to lead to a chilly Halloween, really chilly the first half of the week next week. Let's look at our rain chances jumping up to 40% tomorrow afternoon and evening down to 20% over the weekend. Weekend really looking dry. That 20% is for a few passing sprinkles and then that's about it. Sunday night we're up to 70% and that lasts even into Monday. So fairly widespread activity likely to develop along that cold front and notice on Halloween Tuesday 30% chance that's for the morning. We're really thinking that trick or treating time. The rain is going to clear on out of here and we'll just have a cold breeze out there to deal with. Here's a look at the satellite and radar over the past 12 hours and notice the orientation of the showers and thunderstorms. Many of them were follow, following each other or training, which is one reason why we had such high rainfall accumulations. But this little axis of energy is weakening, weakening, but it's going to be drifting back over San Antonio tomorrow afternoon. That's why I boosted the rain chances a little bit more tomorrow afternoon compared to the morning. Futurecast brings them in a little earlier than I think at noon and don't pay too close attention to the exact locations here. Just the mere fact that Futurecast is on board for popping up these scattered or widely separated downpours with lightning and thunder just periodically coming and going splash and dash throughout the afternoon and even the evening hours tomorrow. So you could have a brief delay with like a trunk or treat or even football games could have a brief delay. 77 right now dew point is 74. It is sticky and muggy and with all the recent rain that we got today, that fog is likely to fill in quickly. So plan for that in the morning. But let's talk about our cold front. You look up to the north, pretty easy to spot the front. Dalhart, Oklahoma, 62, Denver, 33. Gets even colder. Casper, Wyoming at eight single digits in the core of the cold air behind this front. That cold air is plunging southward. It's going to take its time to get here, but when it does, this is going to be a cold front that just slaps you in the face right when it arrives. One of those that you know the cold front hit the minute it arrives. Now it's going to be around sunset on Sunday. Sunday during the day, we're going to be in the 80s. But then we quickly drop on down into the 40s Sunday night, and we're going to stay in the 40s all day Monday and Tuesday. So tomorrow, 74 in the morning, near 80 at noon, 83 for the high temperature, a southeasterly wind at 10 to 20 miles per hour. And again, those rain chances rising for the second half of the day, afternoon and evening. 83 Hondo tomorrow, 83 Converse, New Braunfels at 85. And we could pick up another inch or so, by the way, from the downpours tomorrow afternoon. And then on top of that, another inch of rain possible Sunday night throughout Monday. So more beneficial drought denting rain. But look at the temperature trend. 47 for the high on Monday, 48 on Halloween. So for trick or treating, dress warm, will be in the 40s with a gusty wind up to 25 miles per hour. Luckily, the rain chance is dropping off for the trick or treaters. We think odds really favor dry trick or treating as of now. Check back in for the updates and hey, we rebound to about 60 on Wednesday, which is well below average and low 40s for morning temperatures. How about that? OK, good. And that is some football <laughs> weather, which, by the way, I can't believe we're in week 10 already. Week 10. So next week is the final week of the regular yeah. season. Then the fun really begins with the playoffs, right? So it's week 10. We have five games for you tonight, including Jefferson and Harlandale, the Mustangs facing a must win. And in college football, Texas State can remain in the driver's seat with a win coming up. I'd say I'm probably the freshest out of everyone on our club because I got that uh, six week break there um, toward the end. So my body's feeling good. Yeah, Josh Young's body feeling pretty good ahead of game one of the World Series and big board sports. The spookiness of tonight's high school football games was paired with the nightmare before Christmas costumes at Alamo Stadium. That's where the Harlandale Indians were looking to stay in the playoff hunt against the Jefferson Mustangs, who needed to win this one to stay in the playoff race. Second quarter, our camera got lost in the offensive line, but there's quarterback Amante Carter breaking free with a couple of stiff arms and taking it all the way down the sideline for a 70-yard touchdown run. But the Indians would respond with a pass from Jacob Saucedo rolling out to Michael Powell 
Palomino for the 28 yard touchdown and Harlandale gets the dub 47 34 over at SAISD Sports Complex. YMLA was hosting Bandera on senior night. The Bulldogs in the red zone early, but YMLA's Gage Palma makes a huge tackle on third down. So the Bulldogs go for it on fourth down from the 28 yard line. Jesse Cardenas zings one to Corbin Gonzalez, who sprints in for the Bulldogs touchdown and Bandera would pull away from there to win at 35 to 7. Here are the Clark Cougars charging the field at Ferris Stadium, followed by the Brandeis Broncos. I'm talking District 28 6A. First quarter, Broncos quarterback Lincoln Filia yeah, fires to Jaden Perez in the end zone. That's a touchdown, 14 yards, and it's 7 zip Broncos. But the Cougs respond with a very sweet catch. Quarterback Philip Metzger throws to Lawrence Ford, who makes a one handed bobbling catch for a 40 yard touchdown, and we're tied at 7. Best catch of the week nominee right there, and Clark wins 29 14. The Warren Warriors and the Stevens Falcons faced off tonight at the Gus, and they're both just winding down their regular seasons. Third quarter action, Warren quarterback Antonio Mesa throws a pretty pass to Lorenzo Ramirez down the sideline, and it's good for a 50-yard touchdown. That's beautiful to make it 14-3 Warren Warriors, and Warren takes it by the final of 21-10. Number 12, Wagner was home tonight at Rutledge Stadium, hosting the Seguin Matadors at District 12-5A1 matchup. First quarter opening drive, first offensive snap of the game, the trail Stevens Jones. Jones hands it off to number one, Wanye Taylor, and he's going the distance for Wagner. 45 yards and the T-Bird strike first, seven to nothing. Less than three and a half to go in the quarter. William Reynolds scores for Wagner to make it 14 nothing. Let's go to the scoreboard now for that final and more. And Wagner takes it 41 to seven. Southwest wins big on the road, 49 to nothing. And Natalia beats West Campus 55 to 12. In college football, the five and two Texas State Bobcats return to action this week versus Troy in a pivotal game for for the Sun Belt West Division and the Bobcats, well, they're feeling fresh thanks to a bye week. Texas State, along with Troy and South Alabama, enter this week tied for first in the division at two and one. A win would keep the Cats in the driver's seat for the West Division crown, and it would also mark their sixth win, making them bowl eligible. Well, Coach Kinney isn't looking ahead. Yeah, I think for us, it's just got to be one one game at a time, and and uh, really one practice at a time. We can't. You know, we can't look ahead. There's just there's just no point for us to, to do that. Um, you know, if it's meant to happen, and you know, it'll happen. So we just got to go to work, and and uh, you know, we really control our own destiny right now. So it's all about us going out there every week and and winning a game. This game is also the Bobcats' homecoming contest, and the team will wear throwback SWT uniforms. Texas State will host Troy Saturday night at 6 at Bobcat Stadium in San Marcos. The Texas State Rangers rookie Josh Young, well, Texas Rangers rookie Josh Young is living his dream right after the break. Globe Live Field in Arlington is all dressed up and getting ready to host the 2023 World Series featuring the Texas Rangers and the Arizona Diamondbacks. Probably two teams not very many had going this far. From MacArthur High School alum and former Texas Tech baseball player Josh Young, this is a dream come true. I mean, yeah, growing up in Texas, this is pretty cool, pretty special. Um, that, that ALCS was pretty cool too. Um, I mean, it's always been a dream of mine to play in the World Series, uh, to potentially win a World Series. Um, to be doing it my rookie year, to have a chance to do it, is pretty crazy. Um, the dynamic of the team from last year to this year, just crazy. Um, don't really know how to put it all into words. Um, still kind of surreal. Still have those like, hey, pinch me kind of things. But, um, but we're here and we're ready to do it. Game one is tomorrow night at 7.03 in Arlington. Game two is Saturday night at the same time before the series shifts to Arizona. Those Arizona Diamondbacks are kind of pesky, though. They're very pesky. Yeah. Rooting for the Rangers. Same here? Yeah. Thanks, sir. We'll be right back. Happening tomorrow and Saturday, Haven for Hope holding a fall coat drive. They're accepting any new or gently used coats of all sizes any age or gender. You can drop them off at Haven for Hope uh, tomorrow or Saturday from 9 to 5. We have more information for you on ksatcommunity.com. Also this, there's one more chance for you to get a free vaccine courtesy of Bear County and University Health. That opportunity is going to be next Saturday, November 4th from 8 a.m. to noon at Gustafson Stadium on the west side. The best part, it's free. Yep. If you want to register, just find this article on our website right now, ksat.com.
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have an awesome night. See you tomorrow. Good night.